if you're osteopenic, it might be the right opportunity to consider some treatment options. And for me, those fall into one of four pillars, uh, one being nutrition and medication management, two being postural, three being strength and in, uh, impact training, and four being balance. So those are kind of the, the four buckets that when people come in to see me, I want to know where they're at on, on, their, on each of those uh, different sectors. Uh, so there can usually be opportunity for improvement on any one of those four. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte. And today I have a fellow physical therapist with me on the show. His name is Dr. Patrick Donovan. He works in geriatric, which means pretty much anyone older than 50, 55, outpatient orthopedics in Denver, Colorado. He's excited to discuss how your lifestyle can improve your bone health. So we're talking a lot about osteoporosis and fracture risk and fracture prevention today. And he encourages all of his clients to take charge of their lifestyle from chronic disease management to building strength um, for a lifetime of independence. So we definitely have a shared passion for fall prevention as physical therapists. It's just drilled in our brains. Uh, we've really seen close personal experience of how a fall can really impact someone's quality of life. So I'm excited to talk about um, this topic of osteoporosis and fracture prevention, which of course means fall prevention too. So Patrick, thank you for coming on the show to share your time and expertise. Let's get started just with your story of how you got into PT and then more specifically the geriatric outpatient orthopedics setting. Sure. Yeah, I, I had my first run-in with a physical therapist when I was a teenager and uh, had a bad knee injury uh, playing football. So I, I saw how physical therapists worked uh, not entirely behind computer screens and they got to be active um, and enhancing people's lifestyle uh, to get them back to doing the things they love. Uh, so that was really contagious for me. And after I finished uh, my doctorate in physical therapy, I came straight out to Colorado to enjoy the outdoors and learn to snowboard. Uh, but after a few years, I decided to leave kind of the corporate world and start a geriatric-based outpatient clinic. Um, so I've been operating that for five years now, and I really enjoy uh, the challenge of working with older adults and the benefit because I find that there's a lot of myths and misnomers about aging that I hope to dispel. And uh, when I can change people's lifestyles such that they're coming in and they're showing me their muscles for the first time, and they say, oh, wow, I didn't have this before I started working with you. Um, and that's really um, encouraging to me. And it's a, it's a message I'd like to spread to, to your audience as well. Yeah. So what would be like the top few myths about aging that you want to dispel? Uh, oh, that's a good one. That we're a lot more capable of than we think. Like um, I'll have people come in and do, let's say, a six minute walk test where you walk on a treadmill for six minutes and they'll make in the in the course of maybe working with me for eight to 12 weeks we're able to bring them not only from their age adjusted norm, but beyond that. And then getting that, maybe getting that person to get into race walking and finding a new hobby that they didn't know that they had, uh, or that's probably the most exciting. It's not that that's a myth, but, uh, it's a change of mindset that is really, really grabs me. Then, I guess seeing people make changes that they didn't know possible is is really what keeps me going and gets me excited for clinical care is when people didn't know they had muscles that they have or um, if somebody comes in with a with a fracture like an osteoporosis related fracture and being able to live the rest of their life without having that again, just by knowing which movements to avoid and which movements 
to add to their daily life, uh, whether it's loading the dishwasher differently or picking up their dog food differently. Um, like a lot of the disability that I see kind of dissipates after we are able to challenge them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot that goes into osteoporosis management. I mean, it's one word, but um, I know you're preparing an online course related to osteoporosis management because there's so much to unpack there. So that's going to be the focus of this interview today. And anyone who's listened to the podcast and you know, too, I'm a very linear thinker. And so we're going to start from the beginning. And I just want you to share like, what is osteoporosis and how is it diagnosed typically? Uh, so osteoporosis is a uh, deterioration of the minerals in your spine or in your bones that uh, cause that natural honeycomb structure to become a little bit more hollow. Um, and it is diagnosed by a DEXA scan, which is a fancy x-ray that gets to look at how, uh, how your bone is formed in three different spots your pelvis, your, uh, your leg, top of your leg bone, and then sometimes they do the wrist. So from those scores, you get a, what's called a T-score. And then uh, that T-score determines where you are, are at on your bone mass journey. So if you're below 2.5 on any of those, uh, on any of those points, then you're considered osteoporotic. If you're between one, negative one and negative 2.5, that's osteopenia. And then zero to negative one is low bone mass. Uh, so I find that most people are, well, anyone that's over, I think it's 60 or 65, man and woman should be recommended for uh, a DEXA scan. So that's just something that and your primary care doctor might not offer it or might not be on top of mind, but especially if you know that you, a mother or father had low bone mass, it might be uh, something to ask about. Um, yeah, the, that is the determination. That's your DEXA score. And then from generally when you're osteopenic, you might be consulted on different treatment options to take. If you're osteopenic, it might be the right opportunity to consider some treatment options. And for me, those fall into one of four pillars, uh, one being nutrition and medication management, two being postural, three being strength and in, uh, impact training, and four being balance. So those are kind of the, the four buckets that when people come in to see me, I want to know where they're at on, on, their, on each of those uh, different sectors. Uh, so there can usually be opportunity for improvement on any one of those four. Um, yeah. And that's why people will come to see a geriatric trained physical therapist to hone in on, on one of those to help with their low bone mass. I think it's interesting that um, we were talking offline about my mom and how she had fallen and fractured some bones in her leg. And then when she went to get it fixed, they were like, oh, you have low bone mass or osteopenia. And she had no idea. Um, so I think that this is kind of a, a, a wider problem than maybe people recognize. Aside from having an actual fracture, are there any other signs of low bone mass or maybe osteoporosis or osteopenia that people can kind of self-diagnose. Yeah. And that would be, that'd be falling into the screening tool category, which I definitely do several in the clinic to determine like if you have, are at a higher risk for fracture, which is mainly what I, um, what my main priority is when somebody comes in with low bone mass is just not having a fracture. Uh, yes, there are ways to improve your bone mass, but step one is just not having a fracture. So one of the easiest ones that you can do at home is called the rib to pelvis distance. And I think I should be able to demonstrate this, but uh, the distance between the bottom of your ribs and the top of your pelvis is a certain distance. So if you're standing and you can place 
about four of your finger widths uh, between that, between those two bony landmarks, uh, you're at a low fall risk uh, or a low fracture risk, sorry. And uh, if you have two or even three finger breaths, you might seek further evaluation because what that tells me as a clinician is that your spine, which houses your rib cage, is starting to curl forward, uh, and in the and we call that a thoracic kyphosis. So the further that that your spine is tilted forward, the more pressure you're putting on the front of every spinal segment, and it's that pressure on the front from a curved spine that causes vertebral compression fractures, which are one of the things we want to look out for when we have low bone mass. Totally. And I, a couple of examples come to my mind. And the first is this sweet old lady. Like you can just imagine like the frailest woman you've ever seen. And this is when I worked in a skilled nursing facility and I was her PT and the poor thing couldn't even look up anymore. So she had so much kyphosis that she could no longer extend her head at all. And so she was always looking down and she had another compression fracture because she'd had a fall. And she, the poor thing had to like have this neck brace on. And it was, it was like the, the most awkward, huge neck brace. Cause how do you get a neck brace on a neck that has like very little extension? And so yeah. darn it, like this can get pretty bad. And I know one risk factor that she had was frailty. So under eating, I mean, we work with a lot of people that want to lose weight, but there's really something to be said about being at a healthy weight, not overweight, not underweight. A healthy weight, healthy healthy muscle mass is really important for your bone health. Um, and then the other example is a mild, so mild kyphotic posture, which I was working out in the gym. This older gentleman came up and told me I had good running for him. And I was like, thank you. And then I got to talking to him and his, and his wife, who I noticed had osteoporosis or low bone mass because I could tell because I'm a PT and she was kyphotic. And um, so then all, all of a sudden she started talking to me and she's like, Oh, you're a PT. Do you know anything about osteoporosis? Yes. And um, I said, well, well, how much protein are you eating? And she's like, well, we do a whole food plant-based diet. And I was like, okay, where's your protein? Where's your protein? You can get enough protein on a whole food plant-based diet, but it's sure hard. And so I ended up sending her a bunch of resources and, and protein tables. And I'm like, calculated her daily protein needs. And, you know, from a nutrition standpoint, protein, vitamin D, calcium, all these things are very important for your bone health. Um, and it's so simple. So right now, first thing, if we're thinking about that, like pie chart that you have with the nutrition medication thing, cause she was like, well, my doctor just wants to put me on, on medication and I don't want to do that. And I said, okay, totally understandable. You have a lot of other options. One option to improve your bone mass is to increase your protein intake. But I wanted to pick your brain a little bit because this is really your area of expertise on the strength, on the posture, on the balance. So where do you start with each of those pieces in your clinical practice when someone comes in and maybe they're like that person in the gym, slightly kyphotic, they don't really want to start a bone medication and they want to do everything they can to help their bone health. And I think she's probably in her mid sixties, maybe. Okay. Uh, well, uh, before I get into all the pro physical therapy things, I will say that uh, the National Osteoporosis Foundation generally agrees that uh, there's a lot of good frontline medications for osteoporosis. Um, and the way that they work, which helps kind of facilitate the rest of this conversation, is they help to hold on to the bone you already have. So they don't let you release the bone as it just naturally sheds in all of our bodies. Uh, and those are a lot of them, Fosamax being the first one that's most widely recommended. Uh, so I do try to harp on people that it, it is part of the pillars is medication, but I understand when people don't want to, cause they've had medic, they've had, um, side effects, or they're even on a drug holiday, like they might've already taken it for five to six years. And now they're going down off of it because that's how it works. Uh, and so they might be scaling up on their resistance training or their impact just to find another piece of the puzzle that might help them. Um, so for the, so for the woman that's coming in that you just gave me an example of, 
I would kind of put her through a full movement screen. So overhead squat, inline lunge, I would do that kind of um, finger breath test. I uh, do some overhead, like with the wall behind me, just to see how much shoulder mobility they have or thoracic opening that they have. Uh, and if they if they don't have that certain amount of range, then we're going to make goals and give them exercises to help elongate those muscles, whether it's in their chest uh, or like their lat on their back. Um, so trying to figure out what is causing their kyphosis, because I think people just think I have a kyphosis. I need to do this exercise. And that's not always the case. So having that individualized exam really helps me as the practitioner know uh, where there's room for improvement, uh, whether it's the posture. Most, pe most people haven't started a resistance or impact training uh, schedule, and that's something that I get definitely get to, but after they've learned bone safe mechanics. So uh, lifting from the hips, bending the knees, uh, just introducing weights in a way that's more realistic in everyday life before mm -hmm. I'm starting to throw a barbell on them or have them do kettlebell swings. Like I need to make sure that they can load the dishwasher without bothering their spine. Um, so that usually takes a few sessions for, for this example. And yeah, seeing, trying to meet them where their goals are. So if this woman's already in the gym and already lifting weights, like it's, it's basically a matter of fine tuning that to a bone loading dosage, uh, which is different than a muscle dosage. So totally. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you and I are trying to gain muscle strength, we might aim to do an exercise for 10 to 15 reps. And that would be kind of in that hypertrophy, uh, muscle building stage, but really for strength to promote bone remodeling, we want to be in what's called the strength uh, dosage, which would more so be like five to eight reps of an exercise before you need a break or before you lose like proper quality of that motion. Um, so I always start people with deadlift because it's, it's functional. It's something that they might have to do when they, uh, you know, take the, take something out of the bottom drawer or, um, moving dog food like it's just something that's realistic to them opposed to like throwing kettlebells over their heads mm -hmm. which i also do with people but more so down the stage um so yeah that getting that strength dosage is pretty tough because people are maybe this is also would put in the let's leave the myth let me just dispose myths along the way uh but I think getting to that strength dosage is, a, is pretty difficult for folks. Um, they generally, like they might think they're going to hurt themselves or they're going to be sore. Um, but if you're doing it right and with the right quality of motion and you're progressively res adding resistance over time, um, it really is a, a, a safe protocol. Um, but I understand that doing it by yourself or not knowing where to start are pretty hard um, barriers to overcome. Totally. Yeah. I think they might see someone else doing it and then think, oh, I can do that or let me try that. And then they accidentally hurt themselves because they didn't, they didn't know what they didn't know about resistance training. Like you said, proper form is really important. And I always give people the recommendation to start without weights so that you can perfect your form and then perfect your breathing, especially with that deadlift, which I'm going to have you demonstrate because I'm sure some people don't know what that is. Um, that's important. Like that's really important to get your form so that you don't injure your low back. Um, so can you just demonstrate mm -hmm. what that deadlift is? Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. So he's standing up. And oh, I'm on a leash here. Okay. Uh, so I, I like to, when I start out with people, um, I usually just say, start from your hips, like push your hips backwards opposed to down. So that's going to look like butt backwards, knees are unlocked, and you're kind of keeping your weight in your heels, your hamstrings, and your butt muscles, um, while also pre preserving all the curves of the spine. So even if you do have like a thoracic kyphosis, as long as that's not being made worse by you lifting a weight, 
then it's perfectly safe. Like as long as you're loading your spine in the way that it it's resting, um, then that's okay. So what we wouldn't want to see is if I'm trying to get get low to get a weight, if I bend round my back, that's something we're trying to avoid. And that's, I mean, I'll just keep my hand on somebody's back to make sure that they're not, like I don't feel those vertebrae separate because then I know we're getting motion at our spine. And that's one thing that's helpful to have mirrors or somebody to um, to work out with because it's it's a hard thing to to really notice until your back gets really sore and you are upset and then you just stop deadlifting because you're like, well, that hurt my back, so I'm going to quit, mm-hmm. um, which is never a good experience for anyone. Yeah. So the deadlift is the kind of bent leg squat position. What's the difference? Mm-hmm. Just kind of curious from your perspective, what's the difference between a deadlift and a squat? Yeah, the I'd say the deadlift is more hip dominant, like you're bending your hips and okay. then the squat is more knee and hip. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, they both preserve spine posture, but a lot of people have trouble with a squat just if they have kind of uh, knee issues or knee arthritis it's usually not the first thing I jump into, Mm -hmm. Um, especially in working with older adults. There are, there's almost always something that we have to work around. Like when you've had your own bones for 50, 60, 70 years, I understand that they're going to be a little different than a 20 year old version of you. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in the mobility before stability or stability before mobility or what's your thoughts on those? Uh, that's a good, that's a good in the weeds question, but I'll, I'll cater it to people's goals. If you're a yoga person, then I'm going to, we're going to be working on, uh, like moving through your rib cage, um, moving through your hips, getting all the mobility that we can, especially like some arm focus for all the arm work in yoga. But if your goals are to get a strength program in the gym, um, I might, I might work around your mobility deficits because that's not necessarily a goal of theirs. It's yeah. their goal is to build stronger bones. So I might, uh, like to continue with the deadlift example, like if you're lacking that hip mobility to get down to the ground, right. we might, I might put, uh, the weight mm-hmm. on a, a riser. So you're not mm-hmm. going into, um, so we're not going to kind of push your hips too hard. You're not going to um, like, cause that could take a few sessions just to get hip mobility. I'm thinking of a, you know, my dad or someone like that who definitely has some mobility issues that can take a while just to get their mobility in place to be able to do a proper deadlift or a proper squat, um, proper in quotation marks. So we, yeah, as geriatric PTs, we really learn how to modify the movement Yes. On their goal. Okay. That makes really good sense to me. Um, I was just kind of curious what your opinion was on that. So that if I'm trying to think of your pie, you know, your pie puzzle analogy. So is that really in the strength? Um, what was that other part of the pot of the piece, the strength and impact? No, it's, it's a lot better when it's written out, but the <laughs> resistance and impact are resistance together. Okay. Yeah. And then postural, which we kind of talked about with the the spine. Yeah. And then balance. Let's go to the impact because for strength, you gave some really good parameters, which I'm all for five to eight people. Like if you're not at that high intensity yet, it is so, it's so great to be there. And it's so great to feel like you're really getting stronger. And if you're doing it right, you are not at risk of injuring yourself. Um, out of curiosity, how many sets do you prescribe at that five to eight repetition for bone health? So I uh, will narrow in on that just general strength dosaging for whether you're an older adult or a younger person. So uh, if I'm building a program for the lady in the gym, I'm thinking three to five exercises, five to eight reps and doing that in a circuit three to five times. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So if you can find four or five exercises that, um, you know, maybe two for the arms, three for the legs and doing that three to five, um, sets. Okay. 
is, is my general dosage recommendation. That's usually what I do too at the gym. And I think people have this notion in their mind that it's going to take forever. And it really doesn't take that long. If you just no. use multi, multi-joint movements like these deadlifts, you're, you're working more than one muscle at a time. Um, one thing I'm sure people who are into this stuff may have asked is, well, where's the core exercises? Um, if they have back issues, shouldn't we be strengthening the core? I have my opinions on this. What are your opinions on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, backing up from the osteoporosis treatment, like a, a lot of people will come in to see a physical therapist for pain and low back pain is the most common reason you might see a therapist. So focusing on those different core muscles is great in the beginning of like what I would call rehab. But then once you move into more performance, which is our strength dosage, uh, you're getting a very, very much a good core challenge during. And, and I don't, I don't, I am fine with the term core, but I like lumbar stability better. Like you're trying to keep those segments of your spine, uh, under tension and that and how you do that really matters. So you can have a strong core by just having really strong back muscles that can kind of compensate for a weak stomach. But if we're training the core properly, we're kind of talking to every side of the, I think of the core as like a can, like a Mm -hmm. can of soda, and it has a left, right, a top and a bottom. And we need to make sure we're addressing all of those in the the fastest, the faster I can get people to those multi-joint exercises, squats, lunges, um, deadlift, the the more impact we're able to make on all those different parts of the DEXA scan that gets measured um, for low bone mass. So we're really talking more lumbar, which is low back stability versus are we trying to get a six pack or toned abs here? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, that'd be a different protocol. Yeah, I think think so too. And I think a lot of people miss that like they're doing and they might be actually causing more damage when they're doing the the traditional like crunches or sit ups to try to strengthen their core. They're actually really hurting their back posture. So I'm with you. I don't really do a lot of core stuff anymore. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, as long as you're engaging your core and breathing properly, when you're doing all of these other exercises, you're getting that core quote unquote, the lumbar stability, you're getting the lumbar workout. So that gives me peace of mind to do less quote unquote vanity core exercises, I guess is what I'll consider them. Um, aside from the deadlift, what are some other major functional movements that you often prescribe to people? Well, if those were more for lumbar and hip strength, then for like the upper back, it's not so much a a multi-joint, but uh, I like to do a plank, like a plank on your forearms, uh, whether it's on your knees or on your toes and really getting the proper posture there. So I'll just give a little demonstration as if this were the floor. Um, what we don't want is kind of rounded, like your shoulder blades apart. We want to bring your shoulder blades back, which really cues in um, like the the core underneath the, the lumbar thoracic stability, but also we'll start to get your scapular stabilizers, which I often find are uh, deconditioned or weak as your posture gets more and more rounded. Mm-hmm. Uh, those muscles become... Uh, they don't start to help us on the length tension relationship. So they're really long and weak. And so if we can start to strengthen those and bring those in towards your spine, that's how we, that's how I uh, introduce a scapular stabilization is in a plank. That's um, interesting. So I always like to start with that too. Well, that makes sense because that's how we use it most of the time or when we need to, like for to, to maintain upright posture, it's more of a, it's a little bit more of an isometric movement, don't you think? Versus concentric or like maybe a little bit of concentric, not a lot of eccentric, which is a little technical I know for people listening, but that makes sense. Like when I'm trying to sit up straight, yeah, like yep. sit up straight and do that as a plank on the floor 
I think it's just a different focus for me because a lot of times when I'm doing planks, I'm focusing on my core and I'm not focusing so much on my on my scapular positioning. So that's a really good tip. Yeah. 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 What are some it's other a lot ones? easier to hold a plank when you're uh, if people are uh, like I'll work with people on overhead motion with light weights, and that's kind of hit or miss on whether people have shoulder like old shoulder injuries that make it a little harder. Um, so if like overhead motion with light weights, I just do like a, if you can't do a press up straight with a five pound weight, uh, then try, try with like a seated backrest to like push against, and that will make it a little easier and you'll still be able to get those shoulder strengthening. Uh, and if that's too much or it doesn't work or you're sore in your like joint joints, then I like to get people with their hands, um, maybe like ideally on the ground, but if you just even have them on the table and you can stretch and, and that will help pull your spine into a more upright posture, like trying to get those thoracic, which are your kind of middle 12 vertebrae, getting those stacked on top of each other. Uh, so that's an exercise I like. Which is I really child like lunges. Pose. Like child's pose if people are doing yoga, right? That's the one you're trying okay. to describe. Uh, I would say downward dog was the one I was describing. Downward dog. So child's uh, pose is the hands are like in the front and you're kneeling on the ground and you're kneeling, like, reaching, yeah. yeah, and you're reaching your hands out as far as you can. So it's a lot like down dog, but you're kind of just on your knees. So mm -hmm. would that still... Work. Yep. Yeah, that'd be uh, a, a beginner stage of down dog. Yeah. Gotcha. And okay. that's more like a stretch, uh, which I definitely like, but I like the challenge more of having your legs off the ground and having to get that input into your arms. Mm -hmm. That would be in down dog. Okay. Uh, yeah, those are kind of the exercises. And those are, now that we're going through them, those are five exercises that I give on my online course. So one of the sec one of the modules is just balance, strength, and posture. And I kind of go through my five favorite exercises, which I think now we've at least gone through three of them. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of how to scale those, make them easier or harder based on where you are at in your strength and mobility. Uh, adventure. So that is one of the things I try to cater to on that, on that course. You mentioned lunges too. I think I interrupted you. Did you want yeah. to finish that lunge thought too? Yeah, I like, I like lunges because it really will demonstrate to people how weak one of their legs is than the other. And I think that uh, one of my tenets in, in aging is you're only as strong as your weakest link. Uh, so if your shoulders are weak, you're going to generally maybe have trouble with posture. Um, and if your core is weak, you're going to have trouble walking long distances, just giving examples. But, uh, so a lunge is a really tough one for most people. Uh, I usually start with like a chair next to them just to, because mm -hmm. once you get down there, it's, it can be tough to get back up if you're not ready. Um, especially with that. Uh, weaker leg in front um, and you're kind of making that those L shapes with your legs uh, you really get to it's it's a good way to see people's preferences and weaknesses so I, I usually will if you're doing that at home and you can do five reps with like your right leg forward um, that's when I would add weights into your hands and that's a really good hip hip and spine strengthening exercise as well Totally. I, I love lunges. I'm like this convert. I know this is stupid, but may maybe not. I shouldn't say that this conversation is making me want to go to the gym and lift weights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not stupid. That's if I can get everyone excited to lift weights. I'd I, be happy. I love, I'm, I'm really coming to appreciate the squat rack. So I used to use the Smith machine, which is, um, there's not as much for like movement in the Smith machine. It's a little bit more of a controlled lifting environment. And I've kind of progressed myself to the squat rack, which really does engage your core more because you're the one providing that bar of stability. And I love doing um, squats and then I'll take some of the weight off and do lunges. 
So for me personally, I love loading that through my spine. I know if someone has osteoporosis, that might not be the best choice for them. It just depends on the person, but that really loads my hips and my quads and my core. Um, and I don't feel like I'm sacrificing my posture then to work on my, on my leg stability. So, um, I'm a high, mm-hmm. high advocate of lunges and squats and deadlifts. And I really like straight leg deadlifts as well to really focus on the hamstrings. I don't know if you do those ones or not. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. I like those too. So with the strength, I think we covered some of the the major ones from a posture standpoint. What about posture? So Obviously you've seen me, if you're watching on YouTube, fix my posture several times during this interview, because I'm not using my standing desk. What are some of your biggest tips for people to improve their posture? Uh, the like common way, if I were to say Morgan, sit up straight, you would, a lot of people, if these are your shoulder blades, you might just pinch them together, which is, uh, an okay strategy. I usually like to, when I'm cueing this to get the erectors, which are your muscles that go all the way along your spine from, from your sit bones all the way up to the top of your head, like to get that chain engaged. I usually just try to tell people to pull a string from the top of their head up and that cues in more of the erectors, which are on the either side of your spine than the scapular stabilizers. Um, and those erectors were really, they were built to be long endurance, uh, just to keep you upright, basically, whether you're sitting or standing, whereas your scapular stabilizers are made to do stuff with your shoulders. Good to um, so that's, that's the second thing that I usually have people do, which is a little harder. Um, but after you've pulled your, your spine up towards the ceiling, you might try to if your rib cage is like sticking out from your shirt, you might try to just tip it down. So um, if I were to exaggerate, like I'm sticking my, my, my chest out and that's called a rib flare. So you see that a lot with people trying to correct their posture. Um, so I'd pull, pull that string up towards the ceiling and then tilt your pelvis down. And that's kind of the, it's hard to stay like that for sure. Um, but that's, if, if you don't have like, uh, a lot of mobility issues in your shoulder or chest, it should be uh, achievable to, with those cues to, to sit upright and then don't expect to be able to sit like that for an hour, like start with three to five minutes and work up to 10, 15 minutes but you should always be getting up to, to move your hips around and worry about other, other parts of your posture too. Um, I like the chin tuck. One of my, one of our professors was so huge on the chin tuck too. Like, uh, so, so especially at a, at a computer, I'm turning sideways so people can see the forward head posture. Uh, yeah. Tucking, tucking your chin, pulling it back is really important. Um, what do you think about the cactus exercise against the wall where, you're standing against a wall and you're like pulling your arms back and you're trying to chin tuck and get your head to touch the wall. What do you think about that one? Uh, I don't mind that one. It's okay. Like I think it it brings in a lot of muscles that are generally weak from like forward head posture, thoracic kyphosis. Um, But it's because it, it stresses so many different muscles to be like in this, I call it a wall angel, like where I go like this. Yeah. But I, I understood the cactus fairly easily. Uh, is that if you're limited by like, um, let's say your lat muscle, you know, you won't be able to get very high and it, then it won't really help a lot of the other muscles that you're trying to work towards. Uh, so figuring out like what exact, what muscle or two are your weakest links is where I would start. But if you only have time and to do one thing, maybe the cactus is is right for you. I just like it. Like when I'm in the bathtub, not the bathtub, like when my kids are in the bathtub and I'm in the bathroom, just trying to kill time. I'm like, oh, I'll do a cactus, check my posture. Um, yeah. <laughs> now 
do you do any like postural assessment where you're looking at the kyphotic curvature when they're standing against a wall? Do you do any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, there's two that come to mind straight away, which is standing all the way flush, flush with the wall with your heels back and your butts against the wall and your backs against the wall. And then you measure the distance between the back of your head and the wall. Mm -hmm. So that, I want to say that norm is five centimeters or less. And if it's greater than five, you would want to, that'd be a screen, another screening tool to seek evaluation. Uh, the other one is brings in your shoulders and your uh, like lower neck, which is the dowel overhead. So you, mm -hmm. now you move a little bit away from the wall, your feet are on the ground, your knees are unlocked, but your butt's also against the wall. And you bring that bar up and over your head without losing your low back pressure against the wall. Uh, yeah, Morgan, you're in, you look interested. And smart. yeah. So we want like normal for under 65 is to be able to get the bar all the way to the wall. I think it's like within three centimeters and that's hard. Like I was just thinking, I'm like, I want to try that. Yeah. I don't have many people that can do that before, like, um, before we work on, like I've had people get to that point, but a lot of times it's pretty normal to be 12, 15 centimeters from the wall. Do you recommend any foam rolling for back extension or lat mobility? Uh, my preference is always to strengthen the opposite muscle of whatever's tight. Um, and that's just like my own education and my own experience in the clinic. Like if I can get a person to do something that's a little bit more active, mm -hmm. that helps turn off their lats or turn off their teres minor. Um, that's my preference, but if they have time and it feels good and they notice the difference, I'll, I'll roll a lat every now and again. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if that's their, if they're already kind of like on a stretching program, uh, I try to be the like least impetus on their routine as I can. Um, yeah. Um, I personally love it. Like if, if, I don't know if you personally foam roll, but I love doing it at night kind of after the kids are in bed yeah. and I like to stretch a little bit before I crash on the couch and I just, get such a kick out of any like back crack cracks that I get. And, um, rolling out my lat is something that I know would be more beneficial, but it's not very comfortable to roll out. It's like kind of you lay sideways and you roll up and down and that one hurts a little bit more for me, which is a sign I should probably do more of it. But, uh, I just really like that. I was wondering if you use that in practice. Um, we have just a couple minutes left and I wanted to talk about maybe some of your top balance recommendations is like that last piece of the osteoporosis and fracture prevention pie. <laughs> Obviously balance is huge. Um, strength is a big part of balance. So I'm glad and, and mobility. So I'm glad that we kind of covered a little bit of that, but any top balance recommendations that you have? My recommendation right now, which is so tough because everyone's at different stages of what, especially once we've gone 60 or 70 years through life and we've been really dependent on say our visual system or our yeah. vestibular system or the other system, which is like our feet on the ground. That's the somatosensory. Um, so figuring out which one of those is your weakest is pretty it's either very obvious because you have vestibular problems or vision problems or balance foot problems. Like neuropathy, for example, if someone's diabetic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So like those people might, they'll know that they're, that they have less good sensation in their feet and they just don't have as good a balance. Um, but I do talk about this on my course as well is to find a balance test that that works for you. Like that's a challenge to you that you're not perfect at. Um, so I know you are working more with community engaged folks. So my suggestion, which you can also find on my uh, Heather Lane PT YouTube channel is the four square balance test. 
Uh, and that is probably the best screening tool I have for, for people that just for basically to address your question, like where am I at on balance compared to my peers? Uh, so we want to see that four stage balance test to be under 15 seconds. And then if you're beyond 15 or it takes you longer than 15, then you'd want to seek evaluation. Uh, I wish I could demo that, but it's a little yeah, tough a to set up. Yeah. No, it's fine. We'll link the, we'll link your website and I'm sure the YouTube um, is through there. Um, one of my favorite things as a PT was I asked my mentor, I was like, okay, so it's pretty easy to dose cardiovascular training. You check their heart rate if they're not on a beta blocker. Um, it's pretty easy to dose strength training. You get them to fatigue after about, you know, eight reps. How do we dose balance? Like, how can we tell if we're really at that dose of, are we making a difference? And she was like, well, if they're not about falling, then you're not working them hard enough. And like, how often do we see in the PT clinic? Okay, close your eyes. And then they're like closing their eyes, but you can tell they're not working very hard or, uh, let's mm -hmm. reach for the balloon or reach for the cone or tap. And I love taking people up to the, the body weight support treadmill system so that I didn't have to worry about them falling. And it was just like, I know it gave a little bit more, um, maybe proprioceptive cues, but it made them feel really safe to then try to like challenge them so much more with their balance. So I think that's just something to think about if you're going to PT for balance, are they challenging you hard enough? And if not, mm -hmm. how can they modify the environment and modify what they're doing to make you feel super safe? Like you're not going to fall um, to challenge your balance. So one more question that I had, I know we're a little bit over on time. Um, how would you find a PT that can really help with osteoporosis or these balance issues that we've been talking about? Yeah. If you're like kind of shopping online and looking for a therapist, I would really recommend finding somebody that's familiar with the condition that you're that you're going for. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just have a vertebral compression fracture and you call to make an evaluation and you're talking to a therapist and they don't know what a vertebral compression fracture is, then you might not be in the right place. Uh, or if you're going to a pediatric clinic, it's like kind of bringing your Toyota to a Mercedes dealership, like yes. they could probably fix it, but they're not the specialists. Mm -hmm. So you want to find somebody who's, who is at, at least advertising that they know how to fix that condition. Uh, and I'd be, I'm amazed now after getting involved in my community here in Denver, how much pe folks talk to each other, uh, not to say like, I'm help like I might be helping with Judy's back pain, but I might do Sylvia's uh, balance assessment, and they just know that I'm going to help them with their aging related concerns. So word of mouth might be uh, yeah, sure. a good opportunity too, like asking a friend, uh, kind of being vulnerable with them, like, "Hey, I'm having some balance issues, and I remember you went to uh, for your knee rehab. Were they pretty good with your balance?" And, you know, just lending an ear from your, your fellow aging adults um, is really where I've made the biggest impact in, in getting involved in my community. Yeah. I think another resource is the Find a PT website. Are, do you know if that's still in, in yeah. um, functioning? I think it's, I want to say it's called Choose PT first, or Let me see. we might need to figure that out. Find a PT dot com. Yeah, they may have like rebranded or something, but we'll link that up. I'll figure out what the actual website is and then we'll put it in the show notes. That's another resource because we work with people all over the country and it's like, well, I don't know PTs in your area. Um, and so I think it's a helpful starting place to look for a specialty designation. Um, especially, mm -hmm. I think this is especially important in manual therapy. Like Normal physical therapists, depending on the school, we don't get that much manual therapy training. Um, so I think if someone really has like back issues, they have to be really specific on who they're going to. So yeah, look for the specialty designation, ask friends, call around, 
if they're not advertising mm-hmm. it, that might be a red flag for, for, for maybe choosing yeah. someone that might be a little bit more specialized, but Patrick, thanks for your time today, talking about osteoporosis and bone health. Um, where can people learn more about you and your future course that's going to come out? Yeah, Morgan, thank you so much for having me. It's, it was such yeah. a nice way to like organize my thoughts in Good. a different way, just by like spitballing different questions. Uh, but I'd say the two biggest ways that people can stay in touch is joining my newsletter, which uh, if you just go to my website, heatherlanept.com and go to the blog, it'll prompt you to, to add, your, add your email address. And that's pretty much like the lowest risk way I send about one to two emails a month that are full of awesome uh, aging related content, whether it's empowering aging or knee arthritis exercises. Uh, and all those are hosted on my YouTube channel. So you can subscribe to that YouTube channel and hear a lot more about me talking about different aging related topics. I love it. I always love connecting with fellow PTs, especially those who are interested in geriatrics, because that's really what got me into this. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I hope you guys found this one valuable. Um, If you did, be sure to subscribe to the podcast or YouTube, give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend. All right, Patrick, we'll talk again. Bye.